So I have a bunch of old family film here going back almost 65 years, both in eight millimeter and super eight film formats. I'm gonna show you how I converted them into a digital form because there are quite a few ways of getting this done and all of them come with trade-offs. Those trade-offs either being time, money, quality, or all three. I'm gonna walk you through the different ways and I'm gonna share with you my findings on each method. So you know, I'm not sponsored by any of the companies or vendors I talk about here. I'm giving you my true opinion and the results as I experience them. But before we get into walking down memory lane, if you could continue to support my channel by subscribing and giving me a like, it'd be much appreciative. The YouTube algorithm will also appreciate it. And if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments as I have really been enjoying the feedback you have all been providing. Thank you as always and let's get into it. So let's set the stage for what we're trying to do here. You have a box of old film that you either have never seen or you haven't seen in a very long time. And you'd like to get it converted to some format that you can more easily display on your TV or even upload to YouTube and share with others. Well, I've been looking into this recently and I found basically four methods that I'm gonna share with you and give you my thoughts on. And hopefully you'll come away from this video with a better understanding of those methods and possibly a way to get to your videos and converting them without breaking your bank. I would like to classify the following methods into these four categories. Going professional, buying professional, buying personal, and my favorite, old school. My first method, which is going professional, we would box up all of our videos and we would send them off to some company that will convert them for us and we would just be done with it. And this is not a bad option, but I suspect given that you are here watching this, you're probably more of a do-it-yourself type of person. Now, there are quite a few companies out there which should tell you that there's a decent market for this sort of work. And from what I found is that they all seem to be about the same and provide the same services. A few of them offer some more specialized services for a price, but I don't think that is a path most of you are, are gonna to wanna to take. Most of these companies price their work on conversion by reel, length of film, or time played. So the first thing that I did, and you're gonna to need to do this also, is to total up what you have in your box of memories. For me, that was seven three-inch reels, 10 five-inch reels, 18 six-inch reels, and 37 seven-inch reels. We're in total 72 reels of film. Or if you calculate out the total footage, we're talking roughly 26,000 feet. I'll put the max length of each reel by size and the description to help you with this calculation in case you're gonna do the same analysis. Once I did that, I started to look into what each company offered so I could gauge what I would get for my money. What I found was the following. Most of all of them stated that they needed roughly 10 to 12 weeks to get the work done, so roughly four months. Having done this process at home, I. I think that's pretty reasonable. And all of them I checked would provide the output in either an external thumbstick, a DVD, or some form of electronic download. The outputs would always come in either an MPEG-2, the DVD format, or an MPEG-4. The resolution of all the videos were all stated or advertised as 480p, or a 720 by 480 resolution, which is a three to two aspect ratio. Most of them don't do sound by default, but two of them said that it may be possible in a special case. I have film with sound, so this was a requirement for my project. They all seem to represent themselves by providing a final output that was either a cleaned up version or in some cases the raw output. But you'll wanna check with your company to see what their final product is and what they're gonna give you as the end product. Price wise, here is where the companies landed for my job. The cheapest one to do my whole thing was around $2,200, with the midpoint being around $5,200 and the most expensive being over $11,000. Knowing this, it gave me a good starting point for comparison and how I would measure success for doing it at home, which uh, set the bar pretty high. This was also gonna help me make an educated choice on how I wanted to spend my time and my money for this project. I figured if I did nothing, this is where my memories would stay. Now please understand this is not a video on using outside companies, but instead how to get the job done at home. Also keep in mind, I am not here to promote or discourage anyone from using these outside services. I also know that if I can solve the problem for myself, then others can do it too. My next method I'm calling buying professional. This is the idea of buying professional equipment and the attempt to get the absolute best quality. Now, there are professional digitizers out there that if you're gonna go doing this thing for a business, it would make total sense. But for me, and I am sure for most of you, that level of equipment is not what we're looking for. 
But to share with you some of the higher end equipment, I did find this company called Movie Stuff out of Texas, which for the record, I do not represent them in any way. I just found them on the web. But they offer two different digitizers, a 4K unit for about $12,000 and a 2K unit for about $5,000. Now, if I were gonna go to that outside company that wanted to charge me 11K, I might have gone with something like this. But given I can't afford that level of investment for this project, this path felt like it was gonna be a dead end and not really aligned with my goals. The main goal was to keep as much money in my pocket, but still find a way to share these family memories with everybody. But if you're looking to do a startup company, maybe looking to get on this path, this might be for you. So that led me into my third option, buying personal. In this category, we're talking about spending a reasonable amount of money to get a decent result. So I went down the path of buying one of the many different eight millimeter and super eight film digitizers that you can now get from Amazon for a few hundred dollars. Not cheap, I know, but way under the $2,000 starting point of shipping my stuff off to somebody else or the $5,000 point of going professional. I actually started out with experimenting with the $280 Wolverine converter, but to be honest, I ran into issues right away as I did not realize that the Wolverine has a standard and a pro version. The standard, which is what I started with, only supports the three inch and five inch reels. Now, given I have a lot of seven inch reels, that was gonna be a problem for my project pretty much right out of the gate. What I ended up with was not the pro version of the Wolverine, but instead the Kodak version. I found that the Kodak and the Wolverine pretty much have the same features and similarities by my comparison. But I did choose the Kodak one because I preferred the film guides on the Kodak over the Wolverine. And I might be a little guilty of some name recognition here. Might. When you get one of these devices, it comes with an extra take-up reel and some of the adapters for the reel posts. But what you don't get or what you will need is some standard SD card. Just know that a standard seven inch reel converted takes less than two gigs. Now the way the device works is you put the SD card on the back of the device, you load the film in a similar fashion as you would a projector by putting it on the left-hand side. You select if you're gonna be digitizing an eight millimeter or super eight film with the flip of the switch on the front of the device. And if you notice that the film doesn't track properly, you probably pick the wrong format. You then put the supply reel on the left, you pop up the small film cover, and you feed the film through the track where the backlight is located. I found it best to feed the film from the far left through the device as there's some small tabs that keeps the film aligned as it goes across the light. This works better than just trying to feed the film over the top. Then once you have it fed out to the other side, close the cover and start your conversion. Then wait a bit for the film to advance enough so you can wind it onto the take up reel. And now you just wait for the film to process, which by the way, takes a long time. A normal reel of 300 foot film or a seven inch reel will take about 30 minutes to play normally. But when you digitize it in this fashion, it's going to take about four hours. What you'll get when the projector is completed is a 1728 by 1296 resolution in a four to three ratio. The file will be stored in an MPEG-4 format and the film will be stored at 20 frames per second which is not a normal frame rate for an eight millimeter or a super eight film. Normally an eight millimeter film is shot at 16 frames a second and a super eight was shot generally at 18 frames. In comparison, TVs and movies are generally at 24 frames a second. The side effect of this is you might notice that the people or the cars, they don't move quite right, maybe too fast or too slow. That is something that can be corrected in most video editing software later. For my video here, I just wanted to share with you what the device gave you as its native output. Maybe in the future, I'll share some multiple ways of modifying that output. Now let's talk about the good parts. I have found with using this method, it was only a few hundred dollars and you can safely convert all your film without damaging it. It will take some time, but it is a simple and straightforward process. It does have some nice features for adjusting some few aspects of the capture. So you can adjust the frame size, the exposure, the tint, and the sharpness levels. Like here's an example of the highest sharpness level with the medium and the lowest sharpness level. My personal favorite is the lowest as it seems to soften the edges a little bit. The beauty of having this device is if you don't like the result, there's no additional cost to convert it again. Just rescan it. The third thing I like about it is it captures a great picture. Because it digitizes the images in high resolution, one frame at a time, the quality is incredible. And because there's no manual focus, the quality of the image you will get will look beautiful. And the other nice part about it is if the film does get stuck, the light bulb is not gonna burn the film as it's a much cooler LED light. So you have the flexibility to kind of walk away because it is gonna take some time to digitize. So overall, this is a great device for getting your film converted and I feel is a great solution for just your average Joe. 
Now, there are some issues that I want you to be aware of because this is not all rainbows and roses, is the device's inability to detect the color correctly. This did not happen on all of the film, so it must be something about each unique reel and how it tries to detect the color. But as you can see in this clip from Yellowstone, you'll see that it starts out with what looks like a nice green hillside. But as we pan up into the trees, the capture from the Kodak device turns things brown and then it kind of flips back to green. Next to it, you'll see the same film captured using my final method. So you can see the difference that it was not the film or the person behind the camera, but instead it is the device capturing the image. I would also get situations where the device would turn things blue, as you can see in this last sample. You could, of course, correct this in the software after the fact, but we're getting into post-processing. And again, I wanted to show you the raw output, not something I spent hours making it look perfect. These devices are not perfect, and I want you to know that. The other issue, I sort of talk about it already, is sometimes the film does get stuck, and you need to just give it a little bit of a tug or a pull to kind of get it to continue. Not a big deal, but just something you got to watch out for. Here in this time lapse, you'll see the real stop. And I just had to give it a little tug to kind of help get it going again. This was due to the fact that the joining tape that covered the track holes, the Kodak device just couldn't advance the film. The good news is, is this does not destroy the film. It just makes the conversion process a little longer as you will get a pause occasionally. If you don't catch this, don't worry about it. I found that the device will stop capturing or you're just gonna get this long spot in the video where it's the exact same frame for a while. The last thing I wanna mention is when you use the rewind function, like most old school technology, it does not know when it's fully rewound. So keep an eye on things. My overall opinion of this is very positive. I personally spent months converting all my movies using this method, listening to a little bit of a tick in the background as it worked. And the overall price was not outrageous given the quality and other options. If I had to recommend how to do film conversion, I would definitely give this one a go for just about anyone. Now, in the end, this was not my final or only solution, mainly because I knew I had film that had my grandfather's voice on it and I really wanted that sound. Something that, well, these digital converters just don't do by the nature of how they digitize the film. So let's go old school. Roughly 35 years ago, my grandfather taught me how to run this movie projector here. But back then in the late 80s, my grandfather got himself this brand new Panasonic VHS recorder, literally this one here. And he had me convert all or most of the film into VHS tape over the course of my summer vacation in the garage. Back then, we just projected the movie onto a screen and recorded the movie using that VHS recorder. As you can see, they turned out okay for the 80s and the technology back in that time, but we're now a few decades from that point, and well, I wanted to try my hand at this again. I feel I can do better. So in my final process, I used my grandfather's Kodak Ektasound Movie Deck 285 projector. This one right here, mainly because I knew how to use it and also it supported playing sound if the movie had it. This device also has the ability to project the movie either on the wall, on a screen, or through a slide out miniature screen built into the device, which is how I did my conversions. Now, if you're saying, hey, where do I get one of these projectors? Well, the answer is eBay. Because I just purchased a second one on eBay for about $70. It had a few cracks in it, but otherwise, after a good cleaning, it works just fine. Really, any projector should work with this method as long as it functions correctly. So here's my general process. I set up the Kodak projector on a table and using a small slide out screen on the side of it, I set up a high definition 4K camera to record the film from that screen. Because my projector supported sound, I plugged the direct audio cable from the projector to the camera. If your film does not have sound, this is not a step you need to worry about. I then played the film as I would do so normally. And using the camera, I recorded the video from the screen. Afterwards, I would have to do some processing with the video editing software to kind of trim up the screen and clean up the sound. Overall, it was a pretty straightforward process. I found this method worked 35 years ago, and frankly, my family did not care if things were off a little bit. They just love seeing the old movies. So let's talk about the camera equipment for the moment because it's an important part of the solution. In my case, I used a Sony a7 IV, which was a new purchase for me last year. Now, this is not a cheap camera, as it runs for about $2,000 to $3,000, depending upon the lens and the gadgets that you buy with it. But it does support 4K and shoots some very nice pictures. Now, I got the camera for many reasons, but the main one was because it had the adjustable frame rate, which comes in really handy when you're doing this kind of stuff. So if you're gonna go do this method, a good high definition camera is recommended. 
I'm not telling you to go buy this one, but what helped me justify it for buying it for myself was the money that I was saving by not going to an outside company. Now, instead of giving somebody else a few thousand dollars, I now own a professional camera. Oh, and I have all my home movies converted. But really, you can use just about any good camera with high definition. I even did this sample here with my iPhone 11. Now, I did have to purchase a software called ProCam for $10 so that I could adjust the frame rate and the ISO. But if it's all you have in a pinch, it'll get the job done. I did put the equipment I use for my videos in the description below, but go with what works with you. You might even be able to borrow a camera from a family member or a friend who's into photography. You only will need it for a little while. Because the projector and the camera are coming from different angles, it is possible you could get a form of parallax displacement when filming. This is caused when the projector shooting the image from one angle is different than the device recording it from another angle. What you get when you do this is a bit of a distorted screen. If there are a few solutions you can do. One, if you have a little pop-out screen like I have, it does minimize this effect some because the picture is being projected onto the back of the screen while the digital camera can sit directly in front of it while you record. The other option is to use a device like this, which kind of does the same thing. This is an Optex VS612 that I found on eBay. It's a definitely a recycled device, but you can find plenty of them out there for a few bucks. The last fix, which is not perfect, and you can't remove the effect altogether, is to just try to put the recording camera as direct or as close to the projecting lens that you possibly can. When I did it with my grandfather when I was 15, we tried to mount the camera right over the projector as we did it. With nowadays, with all of the stands and lightweight cameras, you could probably get your camera to sit right in front of the projector and just record the screen as it goes. Because film is really a bunch of individual pictures being passed in front of an open gate or a window, you will get this weird flickering effect. This is because your camera is capturing the video at a set frame rate and the movie is playing at a different frame rate. Then every once in a while, or actually probably all the time, you will get this flicker because the camera is actually capturing the state of the film in between the frames. Now, don't shoot me. I know this is an oversimplification of the problem, but what is important here is that there are a few simple things you can do to maybe fix this problem. The first is to digitize each frame individually, as in the previous example of by personal. But because that's not what this section is we're talking about, if your projector is like mine and it has a variable speed capability, you can adjust the speed of the film just slightly to align the projector shutter speed with your camera. As you can see, I'm doing it here in the example. Notice how the flicker calms down. Then if you need to correct the speed of the film, you could do so using software afterwards. The other option would be to use your camera to adjust the shutter speed if your camera has that capability. On my Sony, I have the ability to precisely tune the shutter speed, which almost eliminates the flicker. On the iPhone, I used a special software that I bought to adjust the ISO and the frame rate. I tried 100 ISO, and then I played a frame rate of, of 1 60th. That seemed to work for me. In either case, you're gonna simply try to sync the two so that the capture and the picture when they're displayed does not always catch the closed gate. Here you can see in another example of the video in its raw format, and next to it, I'll put the same video cleaned up from my editing software. I did not modify the video on color or anything other than cropping. That way you can see the raw product as it was achieved through this method. Now I'm sharing with you the difference between the digitized and the projection. In this example, I picked the same film so you can kind of see a bit of a comparison. And what you're seeing here is a side-by-side -side of the digitized version and the projection version. Now, I hope this helped in answering how I went through and about digitizing my eight millimeter film to Super 8. And if you think of anything I forgot, or if you'd like to see something else, please let me know in the comments. As always, I appreciate your time. And don't forget to subscribe and hit that like button. As always, thank you for watching. Have a great rest of your day, and I'll catch you next time. All right, we're here at the Holiday Inn in Bay Village, a suburb of Cleveland today. It's the 6th of September, the day after 